are waiting to join, um, please answer our question. And we are encouraging you if you feel comfortable to put your um, camera on, um, but also understand that you may prefer not to. Um, and uh, if you can just mute yourself though, that would be appreciated uh, just to help with that background noise. Um, so I don't know whether guys, you can now just let everyone in um, so that we can stop the beeping, um, but um, I think we will kick off. So um, I'm going to um, uh, in a minute introduce you to our guest speaker today. Today we're looking at the glass cliff phenomenon and and I know some of you sort of didn't know what that was um, and so you will, you will absolutely know, I can guarantee you, by the end of today's session. Uh, so we're swapping things around a little bit today. Um, usually I talk about some of the research and then we have um, other laureates joining to talk about their insights, but we are reversing things today. Um, and Alex will first of all give a, about a 30 to 40 minute presentation on this really fascinating area. And then I'm going to share um, my um, story. Uh, with you. Um, you're welcome to put questions in either to Slido or, or through the chat, of course. And I've just noted there to mute your microphones, um, message our support team in chat if you need any help. And as usual, I encourage everyone to be kind to yourself and not try and do your emails at the same time, but just to focus and take the opportunity. Actually, Alex and I were just um, talking about as academics not being able to travel and one of the things I notice is is that I don't engage in that sort of pause and reflect you know which I always used to do with the gin and tonic on the plane um, so you know I encourage you to just pause and and take this opportunity to reflect remind you of course about our website where we cover um, lots of these topics but without further ado, I'm absolutely delighted to um, ask today um, to present to you today um, ARC Laureate Fellow Alex Haslam. Um, he has the honour amongst the many honours listed and you can see them all there and I won't read them out. But he has another honour, which is to be the first male presenter we have had on the Women in Research series. So you can put that one on your CV, Alex. Um, but look, um, Alex is an absolutely amazing um, scholar and researcher. And I saw him present on his work um, and also the work of Michelle Ryan, um, as he will explain. Um, I saw him present on this topic um, a few years ago. And for me, it was just very, very enlightening. And I had an absolute aha moment. And that's what I'm gonna share with you after Alex's talk, my aha moment that I had around this topic. Um, so I think you're all going to find it just as fascinating um, as, as, I, as I did. So I'm absolutely delighted to um, invite Alex to um, share his screen and to um, um, talk to you a little bit about this phenomenon of the, the glass cliff. So Alex, we are heading over to you. Brilliant. OK, and you can see my screen now? Yes, we can. OK, smashing. I don't know. Yeah, I can't. Um, I'll just see there. I, I think, yeah, I can't see. I've just got a picture of you there, Sharon, in the corner. That's all fine. So I'm good there. Yeah, so it's a bit early, I think, in Western Australia for a gin and... Oh, hello. For a Western Australia for a gin and tonic. It's a little bit early here too, one o'clock. But yeah, if you're listening in New Zealand, I think you'd be fine. OK, so um, great. Uh, I'll just I'll get cracking. And I mean, there's a lot of material to cover. And I'm hoping that it's reasonably uh, provocative and informative and gives you a bit of food for thought. And obviously, I want to, we want to leave. This is about three, I'm trying to do a Yeah, uh, three women that have excelled in this. Oh, sorry, Alex. Can I just remind everybody, please, to mute yourselves? Somebody's talking. Um, so if you can just do that, that'd be terrific. Thank you. Great. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, uh, yes. So, uh, lots of time, hopefully, at the end. Uh, for questions. But as Sharon said, I'm going to try and take you through the sort of story of, of our research uh, on this topic. And this uh, line of research was really started by uh, Michelle Ryan and I when we were both at the University 
of Exeter. Michelle's really continued this. I mean, I, I've done a little bit on and off, but Michelle, this has been a real focus for her ongoing research around leadership and women uh, in organizations and society more generally. And actually, interestingly, Michelle's in quarantine now in Darwin. She's just on her way back to Australia. She's uh, to take up the position as the uh, head of the global uh, uh, women in Leadership Institutes, Global Institute for Women in Leadership at uh, ANU, um, which I think is a really exciting appointment. That's going to be a very exciting center. So I'm sure you'll be hearing lots from her um, in the years ahead. Um, we actually, Michelle and I, had worked at ANU before when I was there as a first lecturer and Michelle was a postdoc. She came over and we worked on this, amongst other things, while we were at Exeter. But this really took on a life of its own, this, this kind of uh, research. And um, as I say, it spawned lots, you'll see, it spawned lots of different offshoots and in, in lots of different ways. And I think it's a springboard for lots of discussion, but hopefully too also kind of very concrete um, action. And we can talk more about that at the um, end. So just to uh, start, I, uh, everybody I, I'm sure here who's online would know what the glass ceiling um, is that was a term coined by the Wall Street Journal to describe the invisible barrier that women face when trying to enter leadership positions in organizations. And really, there's you know, there's any statistic you'd like to uh, 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 speak to that. Um, one of the earliest or one of the more influential documents was this US government report about the difficulty that women had accessing the senior professional service in the US. But if you look at for, for CEOs in, in, in countries, um, uh, you know, only 19 percent of uh, Fortune 100 CEOs were women in 2010. Actually, that had gone down by 2020. Um, it, the FTSE 100, again, only four women on those companies gone to change to five, but in, a decade later. And in Australia, again, pretty, pretty uh, stagnant. So the glass um, ceiling is a very uh, real uh, phenomenon. It also ha it reflects not just in women's access to senior positions, but also the kinds of rewards that they get when they acquire senior positions. And, and a lot of work on the gender pay gap which speaks to the fact that as women uh, acquire more senior positions, that their relative disadvantage in terms of pay is uh, kind of accentuated. That remains stubbornly uh, true. And the obvious point, though, is that the idea of the glass ceiling, that metaphor, has been a kind of major focus for efforts to advance women in the, in the workplace and to move them in positions of leadership. What I would say there too is obviously in a very particular sense, it hasn't been as successful as we might have expected. Um, as a, in, there's lots of evidence that in certain sectors, actually things have gone backwards in the last decade as that data from the, those uh, leading uh, stock market companies suggests. There's been some progress in some areas, but it's been pretty uh, patchy. One question I guess that raises, and certainly when Michelle and I started with this work, there was a bit more, I think, optimism about women's capacity to break through uh, the glass ceiling. There was, a, there, was a, and there was some reports that came out, this was really pretty much the turn of the century, around the fact that women were securing more senior uh, leadership positions. But the question that that raised was, so what's the effect of that been? And has that been a good thing uh, more uh, generally? And the catalyst for this line of research can be really uh, nailed down to a very specific point in time, which was in uh, uh, July 2003, when this article was published in The Times in, in London, in, in, in the UK. And what they this journalist had done was they'd looked at uh, leading uh, FTSE uh, 100 companies, but also looked at that in terms of what's known as the Cranfield Index, which just looks at whether or not companies have women on their boards. So if you have a high rank on that index, that means you have a lot of women on your board. Well, what this journalist, her name was Elizabeth Judge, what she observed was that three of the top five companies on the Cranfield Index, so those companies with 
women with more women on their board were all underperforming uh, on various metrics. And conversely, the companies, on, uh, the bottom five companies, though those were companies that effectively had no men at all on their boards, were all overperforming. And this was her commentary on that state of affairs. So much for smashing the glass ceiling and using their unique skills to enhance the performance of Britain's biggest companies. The triumphant march of women into the company's boardrooms has instead wreaked havoc on companies' performance. Corporate Britain would be better off without women on the board. So again, you think that smashing through the glass ceiling is a good thing, but actually when it happens, it's just very bad for organizations. Obviously, that's a pretty depressing message if you're interested in women's emancipation or emancipation more generally. And Michelle and I were kind of piqued by uh, this uh, uh, finding. And so we set about sort of um, interrogating it more closely. And the first thing to say is that indeed uh, there is a relationship between women and company perform sorry between company performance and the number of women on a company board so that was true in that analysis it's been confirmed in other analyses subsequently but the question that we asked was is that is the causal gloss that judge and others put on that data is that correct or is the causal sequence reversed could it be the case that women only get senior positions in organizations when those organizations are doing uh, poorly. And the first study that we conducted to investigate that is published in 2005, was a detailed examination of those FTSE 100 companies that Judge was talking about. And what we looked at there was the relative, the, the rel company performance over time uh, prior to the appointment of women to company uh, boards. And this is the this is um, how companies were faring before men were appointed to the board, not no particular uh, pattern to observe there. And this was the pattern that you saw prior to the appointment of a woman to the board, which is to say that there was this period I was trying to I was trying to use my mouse to highlight that it doesn't seem to work uh, to, on the left hand side of the graph where prior to women's appointment, there'd been this sustained period of uh, poor company performance. And we argued, well, potentially an alternative explanation for uh, judges' uh, pattern, the pattern that she observed, is that this period of unperformance, this, this, this phase of company unperformance, is a trigger or a stimulus for companies uh, to appoint women to those leadership positions. And we called that pretty much from the get go, uh, or the, the hypothesis, if you like, the, the, the kind of glass cliff hypothesis that there was, we argued, potentially an unseen tendency to appoint women to precarious uh, leadership uh, positions. And subsequently, uh, uh, that, that terminology kind of caught on um, and, and, and it's kind of used in various places. And actually, if you look on I, I'm always kind of in, interested when I kind of look on Google or whatever. There's really now, you know, really tens of thousands of articles on the glass cliff. There's really loads and loads of, of, of publications too exploring different aspects of it. If you look on Wikipedia, there's lots of examples of this that people have uh, talked about as kind of exemplifying uh, this phenomenon. The appointment of women to clean up the Icelandic banking industry after the 2008 global financial crisis. The appointment of uh, state premiers like uh, um, Joan Kerner in Victoria, Carmen Lawrence actually from UWA, who uh, when I was over there in, in, in Perth last, I got caught up with, with Carmen and talk about this. I mean, Christine uh, Keneally, uh, all of those people were people who came to the top job in state politics only when their party was facing crushing defeat at the upcoming election. So it's that there was something sort of going on there, which again, we can dissect a bit more. The appointment of Mr. Meyer at Yahoo in the US, the also the hiring of uh, Janet Yellen to head the US Federal Reserve, uh, Mary Barra's appointment at uh, uh, General Motors. Um, interestingly too, a major reviewer in The Lancet in 2018 identified uh, the glass cliff is like a major problem 
in STEM, so that women were only appointed to really senior leadership positions in science when things were kind of going uh, really uh, badly and you needed somebody to kind of present an, a new face uh, to the organization or the activity to offset or, or, or speak to the fact that, that there were problems, but change was kind of uh, underfoot. Lots of, again, lots of other examples as, as well, but I just picked those, as I said, from Wikipedia. Well, does it matter? It's a, obviously, before we get into like, let's have a look at this thing, like, who cares? Well, uh, one observation is that if women are put in these precarious leadership positions where companies are doing poorly, they're more likely to be in the spotlight. They're going to have attention because people are interested in the fact that their company is doing badly and they want to understand like what's going on and they want the leader to explain what's going on. So if your company is doing fine, nothing's really happening. As a leader, your job is a whole lot easier because you're not in the hot seat, as it were. Also, and this is just a, a basic observation, if you're put in a, a leadership position in an organization that's doing badly, well, we, we just know, well, that's, you know, the best predictor of uh, future performance is past performance. So chances are that, that you, well, you, you've got a greater chance of failing than would be the case if you'd been appointed to a more um, comfortable or, or uh, secure leadership position. And also too, and, and we'll see some evidence for this in a bit, it's more likely that if things do go wrong, that um, women will be blamed for that failing. And they'll say, oh, well, that went badly wrong because we had women in charge. And that's obviously the, the basic gist of the, of the judge article. So one of the things we'd argued is that where generally leaders benefit from the romance of leadership, where the success of an organization is attributed to their leadership, even if it isn't really their, their, their uh, responsibility, or nothing for which they should be getting the credit. But the, the, the kind of co uh, converse of that is that if an organization does uh, very badly, then you're more likely uh, to uh, get these kind of unromantic attributions to the uh, inferior nature of uh, your uh, leadership. And uh, that analysis can help to explain, for example, why women's tenure of senior leadership positions is typically uh, much shorter than men's. Again, lots of evidence to that effect. But this was uh, this is a couple a decade or so ago in the US. The average tenure of a CEO is uh, if they're male is eight years. But if you're a woman, it's uh, less than five years. There was a worldwide study by Strategy and the consultancy firm in 2014, basically uh, confirming that point. And one, one of the things that they observed was that if you're a woman in a leadership position, you're much more likely to be like pushed out or, or forced out than go of your own accord. And they argued that that was indeed something to do with the nature of the positions that women were achieving. Well, so far, all I've talked about really is, um, is, is some correlational data, archival data, and we all understand that there are kind of limitations to that. So one of the first things that Michelle and I did was try to uh, get a, a sort of a, a, a grip on what was going on in causal terms. And the best way to do that is to uh, conduct experimental research. And for these papers, uh, this, these studies that were published in this paper in Leadership Quarterly 2008, the basic paradigm was as follows. We asked, uh, people to select a candidate for a leadership position in an organization that was doing well, like the one on the left, or for an organization that was doing uh, badly. And then we gave them a choice between um, three candidates. The, the guy in the middle, he was just like a numpty. He was kind of there to make up the numbers. He was clearly not fit for the task. But the other two uh, candidates were matched on on key aspects of their of their um, uh, CVs. Indeed, that was counterbalanced over uh, uh, multiple versions of their CV. And the question then was, OK, which of those two people who effectively were equally qualified would be um, given, uh, or given the nod for the leadership of that organization? And what you see was that when the uh, company uh, performance was improving, there was a very slight, and in this study it was non-significant, sometimes it's mildly significant, but it's a, a moderate effect, um, or, or it's a slight effect, to preference the male over the female candidate. 
But this was the really alarming finding in, in that research, and it's probably one of the starkest findings I've ever had in any study I've ever done, was that when the company was, uh, per, was declining its performance, that the, the woman was almost always chosen as the person uh, to be given uh, the job. And subsequently, in, in that paper and other papers, we showed that you got basically the same effect when you were choosing a lead lawyer to run a risky and highly criticized case, when you were appointing a financial director to a poorly performing company, or indeed when you were trying to find a party uh, political candidate for an unwinnable seat um, in an election. And that speaks to this observation by John Bailey, the chair of the National Democratic Party Committee in the US. The only time to run a woman is when things look so bad that your option is to do something dramatic. Again, speaking directly to that, the, the examples of Joan Kerner and Carmen Lawrence and Christina Cornelia and so on, and, 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 and many more uh, since. And we've also shown that not just in different contexts, but with different samples, with law, business, politics students, with business leaders, in studies that we've done really around uh, the world now. So we've got the basic phenomenon now, and we know there's something going on causally, that women are preferentially selected for these uh, types of jobs. So what's going on? Well, the first, I mean, as we sat down to kind of think about it, that the, there's obviously, it's quite easy to generate kind of lots of hypotheses. And we were interested in, 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 in one of the first studies that we did on this to just see what an what explanation other people would come up with. So again, I could just ask you all online, just tell me, why do you think this um, happens? And we did a study on the back of one of the first sort of public uh, articles that we did on this was this article on the BBC uh, News. And on the back of that, the BBC allowed us to run a survey where we asked people uh, to say what they thought was responsible uh, for uh, the phenomenon. And it was really interesting to see uh, what they said. There were really a whole class of uh, explanations that related to the, to the idea that there was something kind of bad going on here. Either it was sexism, you know, women are singled out for inferior positions, there's, or maybe there's some sort of group dynamics thing that, that people in senior positions prefer to hire other in-group members, other men for cushy jobs. Maybe women lack peer and institutional support. Maybe women are more expendable or perceived to be more expendable and make better scapegoats. Also, maybe social structural factors that women have fewer opportunities than men and therefore accept riskier positions, whereas men will just wait until a better opportunity comes along. Perhaps, too, appointing a woman uh, in, in a crisis is a way of signaling that your company or organization is changing. And one of the things that we did in the study was look at uh, people's uh, uh, the extent to which those different kinds of explanations were appealing to men and women. And the basic observation here is that those kinds of explanations which pointed to these sort of malevolent forces were ones that um, uh, women tended to favour, where and, and, and typically men didn't really buy into those uh, kind of analyses. There was another kind of explanation, which is a sort of an implicit theory of leadership thing, and the idea that perhaps women are perceived to be more suited to dealing with crisis and more willing to take risks and that men are, are, are better uh, at dealing with things when they're all running uh, sort of smoothly and everything's tickety-boo. And what you see there is that that uh, kind of explanation is equally um, uh, attractive to uh, men and women. I'll talk a bit more about that in a minute. But the really interesting finding, and again, I, 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 the one that I always smile at when I put it up there is, there's obviously another explanation for this, which is that is that it's just complete nonsense, and uh, everything I'm talking about here is just rubbish and just you know scientific fantasy. Um, and uh, you know, and uh, uh, indeed, when we did that article on the BBC, m most of the comments from men were to the effect that this was just a nonsensical uh, 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 observation. There was no uh, substance to it. That women are not uh, differentially uh, placed. Um, in leadership uh, positions. And uh, again, again, people, uh, some of the comments there were, were pretty acerbic. And, and indeed, you know, uh, the interesting thing about doing this research is it opens you up to a whole uh, sort of uh, new experience of like sort of hate mail uh, from people who, who who perceive you as basically doing the work of the devil, which is an, which is an interesting phenomenon in itself. So what we did then are having, if you like, 
done this work to kind of scope the kinds of explanations that people came up with was to see if there was any evidence that these things were at work. Um, and one of the things that we explored was this issue of perceived expendability. And one of the things that we did here was we had these positions in the company that was doing well or the company that was doing poorly, so the low risk position and the high risk position. And then we asked people, how risky is that leadership position? How, how risky would it be to take it on? Well, when you asked people about how risky that would be for a man, what you saw was you had indeed pretty good calibration on that. Yeah, the low risk position where the company's doing well, that's not very risky. But yeah, look, the, the high risk uh, position where the company's doing badly, that's very risky. So nothing really to see there. But when you look at the data for women, what you see, it's almost like someone has turned off their kind of risk calibrator or their risk diagnostic instrumentation, because actually there's no difference in the perceived riskiness of those positions for a woman. And if anything, there's a, sl a slight tendency to say that the low risk position is actually less risky, which is, is kind of uh, fascinating. Another one, lack of opportunity. Um, how good an opportunity is this for a man? Well, the low risk position is a, seen as a good opportunity for a man. The high risk position is seen as not a very good opportunity for the man or less of a positive opportunity. But again, what you see, there's actually a main effect. So leadership positions in general are seen as a good opportunity for women, presumably because they get them less frequently. But again, the high risk position is seen as a really good opportunity for a woman uh, to prove uh, herself. And, and again, lots of anecdotal evidence of that. And indeed, whenever we present this talk, people always come up afterwards and say, yeah, look, you know, that, that, that's bizarre because my first sort of break in academia or in science or in, uh, you know, industry was when I was given this kind of crazily difficult job. But, it, you know, whatever happened and I, and, I, and I made it through. But again, I think this says something about the way that we construe opportunity through the lens of gender and gender related uh, expectations. And the other thing, and this relates to this idea of, of fit, and this is a kind of more complicated uh, story, that, but the idea that perhaps th that women are more suited or perceived to be more suited to handling a uh, crisis. And in this research, which was published in the Journal of Applied uh, Psychology, we gave participants lists of traits and we asked them to identify those that were stereotypic of men and women and ideal managers of successful and unsuccessful companies. And what you see is that the, the stereotypic, the, 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 the male stereotypic attributes are, see, are more highly correlated with the stereotypic attributes desired from or seen to be desirable in the leader of a successful company. But you get the opposite for women. So there's, so the, the, for, female um, female stereotypic attributes are seen to me more fitting for contexts in which organizations are doing a poorly. So what you see, if you like, in the case of men is this kind of just general think manager, think male phenomenon, which has been quite widely dominated in the literature, uh, widely documented in the literature. Um, whereas for women, you have this uh, think crisis, think female association. Um, and again, lots of, of kind of um, evidence uh, 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 to that has, has emerged uh, 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 subsequently. So just to, um, again, to, to sort of, uh, you know, draw things a little bit to a close, again, there's really reams of, of data that I could present that speak to all of the nuances there's lots of research, for example, on signaling. There's some really good recent papers by economists about the power of appointing women to leadership positions in organizations when they're doing poorly, suggesting that this does have uh, strong signaling uh, effects um, and, and that those are, are responded to by markets and kind of market forces, which is kind of interesting, and so on and so forth. So despite some initial skepticism, there's now a large body of evidence that, that supports claims that men's and women's leadership uh, experiences 
are quite different. Uh, Michelle and I did uh, this uh, kind of major review in 2007, but actually just last year there was a, a, a meta-analysis published in Site Bull, which kind of documents the effect and the nature of support for it. And, 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 and there is interesting variability. So you see it more in some cultures than others. You see some change over time too. So there's some evidence that in some places it, it seems to be less pronounced. And there's certainly more awareness of the phenomenon now, which presumably feeds into that in certain ways. But the general observation then would be that women are given risky, more precarious positions when they're appointed to leadership positions, they also, if you like, meet with a kind of more hostile uh, reception. So they have a kind of less romance in those positions. They don't get the sort of honeymoon periods that other people get. They're, they're, they're on the spot from sort of uh, day one. And also this background thing of they're kind of less rewarded in both informally and formally in terms of the money they get, but also the recognition and, and more general uh, 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 valorization of their efforts. Is it seems to be uh, is diminished relative to the sort of as I say the reception and uh, accolades that are uh, uh, visited upon uh, men. What we also found in some of our other research, and this is research by Kim that we did with Kim Peters and other colleagues, was that was that those sort of uh, experiences are like more likely to fuel a stress on the part of women. So those that they're actually going to be less comfortable in their leadership positions. Again, they're, they're you know, they're fi they find it harder to relax in part because they really uh, uh, notice a, a kind of tangible lack of support. And that that can uh, trigger a kind of disidentification with your role, with your position, with the organization that you're in. And then that can feed into just a desire to kind of opt out altogether. So there's a big literature really on women opting out of senior roles in organizations. And there's a kind of narrative around that as uh, around, well, lead, uh, women just can't cut it. You know, they're just they're just snowflakes or they, you know, they can't take the heat, all of that sort of stuff. But we've argued, well, no, that's actually just because of the types of experiences they have, the structural and psychological uh, terrain that they have to negotiate, which is altogether more problematic and toxic that men uh, account. And there's there's reams of stuff kind of written really around that and the idea that there's some kind of biological uh, thing that, that makes it uh, hard, if not impossible, for kind of women to do leadership well in our studies when you uh, control for all of the things that i've talked about that biological thing becomes basically uh, insignificant so yes you can if you like tell biological stories in this space but our argument is they they don't really stack up against the evidence the the, the data here points to something structural and social psychological um that is that is is uh, you know is having these uh you know profound uh, consequences so what remains to be uh, done well i think and this is again some of the more recent stuff that we've written on this sometimes people talk about the glass cliff theory i don't think that what we're talking about here is a theory we're just talking about a phenomenon something that you can observe like global warming so a lot of people have have, have um, like fixated on like, well, is the theory correct or whatever? And, uh, and, uh, and well, is this thing real or unreal? Um, and, and, and I think, you know, the question isn't, uh, as I say, isn't really, I don't think that's a particularly fruitful uh, question. I think the more interesting question is when it occurs and why it occurs and how to deal with the problems it creates. I'd also argue that we need to stop fixating on single cases you know, uh, Michelle and I would both bear testament to the fact that every time there's one of these kind of situations, like Janet Yellen gets appointed to the head of the reserve board in the, uh, the bank in the US, or Julie Gillard gets made prime minister or whatever, and so on and so forth. You know, the phone runs hot because people are going, is this a glass cliff or not? Well, you know, the reality is in any single case, there's a lot going on, uh, you know, that you can't, you can never answer that question definitively. I'm not sure if it's even meaningful, what you do need to do is look at the aggregate data of the form that I've presented to, uh, if, I think, uh, answer those kinds of uh, uh, questions and then look at single cases through the lens of that broader body of research. 
I also think too, and I guess it, uh, again, there's, there's a whole other talk I could probably give on this, and is that we need to really stop thinking about this. And I think this is true of lots of work in the space, and potentially lots of the other seminars that you've had. You know, the, the, the glass. If there's something here about kind of women and leadership, and this is, you know, this is something about just that sort of we just need to like focus on fixing women, as it were. Well, you know, there's that. There's this uh, great book written just a couple of years ago, "Stop Fixing Women." If you think back to that judge article, is the problem there women or, or is the problem the fact that all of the leadership positions in those top um, uh, five FTSE companies where there were no uh, problems, all of the people on those boards were men? So is the problem here not so much the glass cliff, but the glass pillow or the glass cushion that, sorry, there's a bit of background noise. I can't, there's a bit of scrunching it. So I don't know if other people can hear. But the, um, uh, is the problem the glass cliff or is it just something about actually how uh, men are selected for these positions where they're very safe, they're very secure, they're never subjected to any scrutiny and they can just get on doing what they like. I think that's a real question in politics, for example, where you see that a lot of the really problematic MPs are kind of men who are in safe seats and they just go tropo, go rogue, doing their own uh, kind of thing because there's very little uh, kind of uh, of accountability. More generally, I think, and, and, and I think if you really pull back from this, I and Michelle and others, my other colleagues, I think would argue that what we really need in this space is a is just a new way to think about uh, leadership. That's a, a central argument in our book, The New Psychology of Leadership. And also related to that, we need to have new ideas about how to develop uh, leaders. I think that's something that's really come to the fore in the context of the pandemic. There was this uh, review that we wrote earlier this year about some lessons around leadership for the pandemic, many of which have got to do with gender and the fact that, uh, again, there's lots of studies in the US but around the world showing that women uh, as leadership in that context of that cross crisis, which we, uh, clearly there was, this was a situation, you know, which in many ways fits the glass cliff kind of scenario where women uh, came to the fore in the context of the crisis that their ability to deal with that was uh, demonstrated in multiple ways. But I think the, so their success, I think, needs to tell us just more generally about how we need to be doing uh, leadership. And then I think more generally, when we're thinking about developing leaders, we need to move away from the kind of masculine, heroic models, which are the stock in trade for most um, business and management courses. Um, and we need to uh, encourage leaders to focus on the we of leadership, not just the I. That's a major theme of our book. We need to help leaders understand how to engage effectively with the diverse teams that they lead. I think that's something that leaders often really struggle with. You see the government, you know, they, it's clear that they just sometimes just don't know how to manage diverse groups. So you look at COP, you know, this is a spectacularly undiverse group. Well, that's just hugely problematic if you don't know how to create and manage diverse uh, groups. And then actually you need to help leaders work with group and organizational diversity in uh, productive ways. And that's really been the focus of the work that I and colleagues and uh, Michelle, but other people have been doing really around the world um, in the last year trying to develop something we refer to as a social identity approach to uh, leadership development. We, we've uh, trialed this in lots of different organisations. Most recently, the biggest trial is with the House of Commons in the UK, where we were trying to put a totally different spin on the way that you develop and bring leaders on and, and encouraging them and, and giving them experience of working with diversity. So I just want to end by uh, thanking all of those people who've worked on uh, that research. And obviously, uh, Michelle, uh, I hope she gets out of quarantine soon and is able to join uh, this conversation in person. But again, I, I, just to conclude, I think we're not going to make progress. And I think you see that with the glass ceiling data. You're not going to uh, make progress just by going, oh, this is a bad thing, and let's have little initiatives to deal with this, and little ideas and little schemes and shit like that. Actually, no, you've got to fundamentally reconceptualize, reorient and recenter the way we think about leadership, the way we talk about it, 
and critically, the way that we seek to train and develop it. And I fear that unless we do that, unless we're motivated to do that, we're going to be stuck in the toxic spin cycle that we're in now uh, forever and a day. And God knows it's one that we need to get out of fast. OK. Thank you so much, Alex. Um, absolutely fascinating presentation. Uh, yeah, and I'm sure um, everybody um, has got yeah lots and lots of claps there. So absolutely fascinating, slightly depressing also, um, um, but some really important and powerful messages there. And maybe we'd love to invite back some of you or some of your colleagues to delve a bit more deeply into some of those leadership ideas. Um, but thank you, thank you again, Alex. What we'll do now is I'm going to talk for a little bit and then um, Jess is going to look through the chat and pull out some questions and through Slido and uh, uh, and that's where we'll go. So I guess the first time I heard Alex do this talk, um, I really had an aha moment and the aha moment was for me, oh, I have actually been in a glass cliff situation, but I had never understood that before um, until I heard Alex talk. And it was actually tremendously helpful to understand that that had been my situation. And so I think a lot comes from awareness too, and doesn't change everything, but it also helps. So let me just share with you uh, my situation. So. Um, um, I did my PhD in a particular research institute and um, it had funding from the Medical Research Council for 10 years and then it had funding from the Economic and Social Research Council. This was in the UK. Um, that funding ended um, and the director, who'd actually been my PhD supervisor, resigned and I was headhunted for this position. Um, so I was at that time living in Australia and this would have been about me going back to be the director of the place that I'd done my PhD. Um, so this was really, really attractive for me. I felt very flattered. Um, and I felt incredible loyalty to this, this research institute that I really loved. So I went for the job. I got the job. I actually um, negotiated a good salary. In fact, the vice chancellor told me that I was getting paid more than the Nobel Prize winner in the university. So, you know, here's awareness, right? Because I personally hate that sort of negotiation, but I knew that women are systematically underpaid. And, and so I was determined to get a decent salary. So I did, and so that was good. So that was a good start. Uh, but then two things happened. Um, so um, the first thing that happened was I literally got off the plane and got home and I had a phone call from the vice chancellor um, saying it's great that you want the position, but we want you to share it. We want you to do a co-director position with the person who was second ranked on the list, who happened to be a male. Um, so that was the first thing. Um, I was then subjected to intense lobbying from the vice chancellor and the other bosses as to why I should agree to a co-director position. And I didn't agree. I thought it was not reasonable and I thought it would undermine my position. So I fought hard <laughs> and I did not agree to that. Having said that, it was very disconcerting and I thought I thought maybe I've made a big mistake here. The second thing that happened was there was one major senior, again, male professor at the Institute who was the one who was actually generating income. So he called me up um, about a, a month after I'd accepted the position and said, I'm really sorry, but I'm leaving to another institution and I'm taking all my funding. So um, three months or so, six months later, whatever it was, I arrived um, to take on this position, running an institute that had no funding, that had bosses that were already annoyed with me because I hadn't agreed to the co-director role um, and uh, that were quite, I have to say, probably paternalistic would be a generous phrase. Um, we had staff who I loved and adored, many of them were friends, but had been living in a world where they'd always had funding and were not really um, ready <laughs> for a situation where we had no funding. Um, and we had, there was, there was another issue that I actually can't disclose for confidentiality reasons, but let's just say I was handed a personnel file that was about um, this thick, 
uh, about uh, one of the, the key staff members there. So um, I think in hindsight, I actually had a quite precarious leadership position. I did not understand that at the time. I also, let's say, had a three month old baby and twins that were three years old and family support that was only 10,000 miles away. Um, so, um, yeah, what happened? Well, cut a long story, sto um, story short, I stayed in the job, had a lot of battles, um, had a lot of wins, um, eventually left after four years because they restructured and all sorts of reasons, but look, in the end, made the best of the situation. So I guess the two questions I wanted to just touch on were, number one, um, do I regret going? Do I regret taking that precarious leadership position? And um, that's the first question. And then what could I have done? Um, so the first question, do I regret taking that position? And the answer actually is no. Um, and there's three reasons. And the first is I just learned so much. I actually had a lot of autonomy in the job and I was able to experiment and try things. I was trying to create this huge change agenda, trying to basically create a research institute that was self-funding um, within an incredibly short period of time. And I just learned so much and I do not, so I do not regret it um, at all. One of the things I learned, the second thing I learned actually was that I wanted to keep doing research. And I actually learned, and, and maybe Alex, you talked about women opting out of leadership. I guess I learned I wanted to opt out of leadership actually. So maybe it was sort of part of this phenomenon, but I did learn that I actually wanted to be doing research more than managing other people doing research at that point in my career. So that was really, sometimes I think it really is important to learn what you don't want to do as much as what you do want to do. Um, and so that was something I took when I did leave the job, I was very focused on my research. And, and the third reason I don't regret it is because my children loved living in the UK and I loved living there. And, you know, I've got these three children who are sort of expats now who talk fondly about their time in the UK. Um, so, you know, I don't regret it, but would I do anything differently now knowing what I do know? And the answer to that is absolutely yes. Um, first of all, it would have really helped to understand this phenomenon because I think I would have approached it very differently if I'd understood it. Um, I think one of the things I should have done and I didn't pay attention to, I was very focused on get a good salary because I knew women get lower pay. I didn't pay enough attention to what do they expect from me? What, are they, what do they expect by way of performance? And I didn't pay enough attention to making realistic expectations before I, expect, uh, I accepted the job. It was not realistic to expect that I could arrive from Australia and suddenly turn this institution around to have masses of funding within a year. That was not realistic. Um, and yet that was sort of the expectation and maybe not even their expectation. It was my expectation that I put on myself and it was unrealistic. So I think I would have pushed for much more clarity around what actually is you know, even before I accepted the job, but certainly when I accepted it, what is reasonable um, expectations and being really clear about what those were. The second thing I wish I had done was get more support. Um, you know, I wish that I had got coaching probably, um, someone to just provide help when I was navigating some of this, because I, I, I was often finding myself quite confused by the behaviour of, of some of these bosses. And in hindsight, a, an external coach would have been able to just really help me see what was going on. Um, and then I think I also would have sought out internal sponsors. And remember, we talked about mentoring and sponsorship a few months ago. I actually think what I'd do now if I was in that position, I'd actually look up senior women in the university and I would go and meet them and have coffee and find some willing to support and help me. Um, and then the third thing I think I would have done is I would have been more assertive. I think I was too focused on proving myself, showing that I could do it. You know, I was getting paid more than the Nobel Prize winner. I put a lot of pressure on myself. I should have been more assertive and actively managed my bosses a lot more. I think I had this naive idea, if I just do really well, I'll prove to them that I'm okay. 
um, instead of actually negotiating with them, pushing with them, demanding more. <laughs> I should have been more assertive. Now, we all know from our other talks that that wouldn't have gone down well uh, because it, People don't like assertive women. We're labelled as aggressive and bossy and all that. But that's what I should have done and that's what I would do now in that situation. So that's my story. Um, and, uh, and you know, thank you, Alex and Michelle and your colleagues for the wonderful research because it really helps to, you know, sort of understand that, that these things happen and, and to use that knowledge in being a bit wiser about how you approach things. So that's it from me. So I would love to um, go over to Jess, who's going to, I think, share the poll and yes. ask us some questions. I can. I'll share the poll first. Um, we had about 36 people respond, which is great. Um, and we can see, can you see that now? I think it's coming. Not quite yet. Oh, yes, there we go. Okay, okay great. Um, so we can see glass ceiling is the most common. So people were able to choose more than one option. So it is likely that we've had people who have chosen glass ceiling and something else. Um, but then we also have quite a number of people also saying that they've experienced this glass cliff phenomenon as well. Oh, we've got some more people responding. <laughs> That's great. Um, and then also, yeah, a few people also saying they've experienced the glass walls phenomenon as well, where you're being pigeonholed or you're not able to move in a more horizontal way um, in your career or your role. Um, so, yeah, if you haven't responded to the poll, it would be great if you were able to, because it's interesting for us to see um, in our attendees the sort of prevalence of these um, issues. So the poll will still be there. Um, and. Are you guys happy for me to ask some questions? Great, okay. Um, I guess to Alex and Sharon, would you like to answer together? Fine, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. we had a few come through the chat, so I might start with those first. Um, so one person uh, um, asked about, um, has the flow on effect of the glass cliff on younger generations of professionals been studied? For example, they say, if young male professionals see male managers in less risky positions, a move into management will be more desirable for them. Conversely, if younger female professionals see their female mentors and leaders having a difficult time in stressful leadership positions, they may not include they may not include a move into leadership as part of their ambitions. Well, I think that's a reason. I, I, I don't think, I mean, there's a lot, we've always said that it's quite difficult to do longitudinal research in this space, which I think is just a general observation. That you could see why you would need that. Um, but I think that's a reasonable hypothesis, and it, but it would be just interesting to think about how you'd get traction on it. Um, uh, you know, I, so yeah, I, I'm, I, you know, I'd be, I, I, I think, I, I, I'm not aware of any work that's looked at that, but I think it's a plausible uh, thing to look at and, and I, it speaks I think to the idea that yeah that you know when women are in leadership roles and if they fail that functionally that has kind of lots of impact um but but one is that it can sort of justify again going back to that judge article it can just kind of justify uh, everything else because you say yeah look fundamentally we, went, we did try that once you know we tried that 10 years ago we put a woman in charge and it all went horribly wrong so so there's there's lots of I think things that have these flow on kinds of effects and I think yeah there's, it's kind of overdetermined in that way but I think that that thing of expectation experiences and 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 and, and not having a, a exposure to people to models who've had positive experiences I think is is part of the story I, I I'm thinking too of some colleagues of ours who've done stuff in sport and women's experiences in 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 coaching in sport for example where you know they, they just have a really really tough time and 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 people are going like do i really want to put myself you know out there for that and just say no it's just go and do something else so that's pretty lots of anecdotal stuff around that but yeah i think you, the definitive study to address that hypothesis i think remains to be done but it'd be something interesting to explore yeah i think it's a fascinating potential phd or research yeah. question there I, I would just say that's why in my own story I wanted to really highlight I didn't regret the decision that I made actually. So for all its challenges, I do feel I learned an enormous amount and I and I would encourage even well, maybe I shouldn't encourage, but 
I do think that for me at least, um, it was worth it was worth it, even though in hindsight it was quite precarious. Mm. Yeah, I mean, and that relates to the general thing. I mean, you know, we we haven't really yet done the the kind of like the really longitudinal study of you know how do people go through them and negotiate, and what's the what's the long term consequence. Our sense is that it leads to really polarized experiences. So some people tough it out, and they and they learn life skills, and they build support networks, and all of those things, and they make it through. But a lot, but another sort of category of of people um, don't aren't able to aren't able to find their way into that space, and you sort of never hear from them again, type thing. Mm. And that's part of the issue is that though that that you, you it, uh, it, it's, it's difficult to capture the people who go missing in action because they're lost to the world of data, if you like. I, I do I do remember one case though where. Uh, I gave a talk in London, this would have been about 2008, and I gave a talk, and afterwards, uh, uh, at the end, a woman who was a senior, she was a, 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 on the board of a big bank in London, and she came to me and she said, look, you know, she said she asked a question that was a bit, you know, a bit nasty or a bit like, I just think this is kind of nonsense. I think you're over-egging it, and I don't think this is a really good story. And she, um, and, and she came afterwards, and she wanted stuff. Anyway, I said, well, look, you know, this is a pretty important question, blah, 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 you know, this sort of thing. Anyway, she wrote to me and Michelle about five years later and said, I want to really apologize because I, I didn't realize that at that time, you know, my worldview was dictated by this very male view of the world that I had bought into. And it wasn't until they threw me under the bus that I really was able to step back and get perspective on that. You know, and I think that's the thing. Like, you know, I think it's a bit like the lean in thing, you know, yeah, like leaning in is fine if, you know, if people respond to you and all the rest of it. But there's an awful lot of people who get lean in and get their heads chopped off um, and they're not there to tell their stories. Actually, I heard a nice expression today or saw somewhere. It's not so much lean in, but lean on, you know, you know, and in some senses, we it's this the importance of absolutely about the importance of bigger picture change, but also the importance of support mentoring and sponsorship and those things are just so important in this space yeah 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 absolutely yeah thank you both i think we probably have time for one more or maybe two more we'll see <laughs> um i thought this one might be interesting because i feel like it's a little bit of a combo of um a glass ceiling and a glass cliff so the question reads, it can feel like there aren't a lot of opportunities to move up in status or authority. And so if someone doesn't take a glass, a glass cliff position, maybe there won't be another chance at leadership. Is this borne out in data that women have who decline bad opportunities are unlikely to have a better option come along later? Well, I think that, I mean, I think that study that I presented, that data about the perceived attractiveness or riskiness of a position reflects that. So that the risky position is seen attractive. And I think that's relative to either the other opportunities that you have or the opportunities that you imagine having. Now, whether or not that's the case, again, that's another one of those longitudinal questions it's actually incredibly difficult to answer. But, but it's certainly the case that people perceive that they won't have those opportunities and that that perception is, is, seems to be pretty critical to their decision making. Like as a bloke, you can just think, look, no, I'll just, I'll just sit back and wait for something better. And, and I, the thing about women there is I think on one hand, they might say, mm, maybe I won't get another chance. But I also then look at the advice they're getting from other people and I think other people are saying, no, you might not get another chance. So again, I think it's the type of informational support you're getting in that space, I think, looks very different for men and for women. Well, and I think also if you bring the glass ceiling data into it, which in, in yeah. suggests women don't get as many opportunities, yeah. then, you know, it's sort of perhaps reasonably rational in some cases. Yeah. 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 And, and I also do think that issue is about the rationality is interesting. When, like, you know, this issue about like, why risk looks different for men and women is to, is that, the, the, of course, your, your understanding of risk is conditioned by reality. So, so it's not that they're like mad, it's just that they confront risk takes on a whole different meaning in, a, in the sort of space that women and, and other, and I, I mean, I talked obviously a lot about women, the, the, there's lots of other stuff about the glass cliff for other members of minority or disadvantaged groups, and you see pretty much the same pattern. I know one of the questions in the chat was about that. And, and if anything, actually, it's worse for people 
who uh, um, uh, I mean, it has a slightly different flavour, but for, for, for you know members of ethnic minorities and the like, you know, or disabled people or something like that, I think there it, it, it looks, you know, again different, but but is still pretty clear that there's, it has to often be very special circumstances for those people to get those opportunities. Mm. Jess, I think we might have to stop there. We've just got one more minute. So, look, okay. first of all, um, thank you again, Alex. Absolutely fantastic. And um, thank you, Jess, and the team behind the scenes um, for the Women in Research series and the Australian Research Council for funding it. Um, remember to check out our website. You can see all of our past, um, present, our past webinars and, and other material there. Um, we have got one coming up in. Uh, we have got one coming up in uh, the, on the eighth of December, uh, called. Um, well, I've called it networking for everyone, even introverts. So um, those of you who struggle with networking, um, or even if you don't struggle with networking and you'd like to share your tips on what you do, um, please do come along and join us. So um, at at this point, just love to say thank you, everybody. Uh, check out our website and thank you most of all for you guys um, for joining us. It is absolutely terrific. I saw at one point we had 157 women and men and it's great to see some men here too um, talking about this topic. So thank you all so much. Thank you everyone.